Hey, Mosaic, I'm uh, adding a little thing here before we actually get into the episode proper. Um, I recorded this episode uh, about four days before uh, I preached this past weekend. And so um, I get into some weird time stuff where I'm trying to say, hey, this weekend, when we teach about it, this is what's going to happen. Now that it's actually happened, we realized uh, Friday night, uh, Michael Summers got sick. And so he didn't end up um, doing the body life and the kind of closing portion. But um, I did that in his place. So it, it shouldn't be that confusing for you. Um, the other thing I did want to note uh, coming into this is about halfway into the episode, I say, ah, oh, man, we should have done a little bit of a, a heads up of where we're heading. Um, the The episode today uh, with me and Matt, we are, uh, we get into some pretty um, gnarly sexual conversation stuff. Um, I think it's grounded. I think it's helpful, but it, it, um, if you were uncomfortable in the sermon itself, um, there's some stuff that comes up in this episode that you just might, uh, um, want to be wise about who you're listening to this with. And, uh, uh, I, I think we ended it saying, please reach out, but, um, you're always welcome to, uh, uh, track me down, call me or grab me in the foyer or after service. And, and, uh, I uh, would love to uh, talk about any of these things with you. Um, here to serve, here to love. So anyway, on with the, uh, the episode proper. Thanks. Thank you for listening to Footnotes, a Fellowship Mosaic podcast. This is a space for us to dig deeper into scripture, what is happening in our community and culture, and continue the conversations we start on Saturday nights. We are excited to have you join us as we pursue truth, holiness, and redemption together. Well, hey, and welcome to uh, Footnotes. It's Natsel, and uh, good to be with you. It's been a while since I've been in here. Um, we've been in the book of 1 Corinthians for a while now, basically the whole fall, and uh, uh, the last couple of weeks um, and the next couple of weeks, we are uh, finishing up chapters 6 through 8, and uh, 5, 6, 7, and 8 have had um, some pretty substantial passages uh, dealing with sex and sexuality and disordered sexuality and brokenness around sex and, and uh, destructive behaviors. Um, it, it's it's spread the gamut of things. And so um, I know we have been uh, trying to pastor faithfully through that. We've been um, trying not to um, overindulge or underindulge from the stage and what we say or don't say. Um, I was I was in a small conversation with a friend and said, man, I wrote a, a lot of spicy words in a sermon prep today. And he said, just remember that you're trying to uh, help the people in the room. And so if it's just shocking and it's not helping, maybe watch that. And I said, okay, I won't say that word as many times as I had intended to say it there. I'll cut that. Um, but in, um, in my own life, I've faced uh, sexual addiction. I, you know, I, I have a, a, a recovering porn addiction from the junior high, high school, college. Um, thankfully, I've been really uh, grateful that the Lord has protected me in this space for uh, many years since then. Um, around the time I, I got married was the time that that, um, that thing stopped. And I know that's not everybody's story, but God's been really gracious to me in that, and I'm grateful for it. Um, and, uh, um, but I still live in a broken, fallen world and I still, um, have, uh, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boast, boastful pride of life that, uh, drive and compel me. And so, um, feeling a little, um, like I'm, like I'm swinging above what my skill set is. I, I want to invite a friend in, uh, who I think maybe has some more experience under his belt and, uh, could, uh, be an asset and a gift to our church today in this conversation. So wanted to welcome, uh, Matt Tolson and, uh, I'll let him kind of give a piece of his story here about, uh, kind of what he's doing and why, why, uh, why I think he would be an expert to invite into this conversation. So, Hey Matt, how you doing? Hey, Hey Matt. Um, good to be with you. Yeah. Um, expert i'm not sure but i will give (laughs) us a little bit of background here on um you know kind of how and why i might be speaking into a few of these things so um first and foremost uh one of the things that that i that i do is i am a counselor okay um and i've been a counselor for a couple years and um i have a practice in bentonville okay and um i would say that a decent percentage, probably half of the people that I currently see, um, sexuality, sexual brokenness, um, some form of their sexuality uh, is part directly a part of why they have come in to see me. Gotcha. Um, and then the other group, uh, even if it's not directly a part, it almost inevitably mm. comes up. Yeah. Whether that's dealing with couples, 
individuals, as people dig into their past and start seeing patterns and uh, of relating to others, they realize like, oh, there's also this thing. Mm, yeah. So that's the that's kind of the the first place I'm coming from, and the second place that I'm coming from is a very personal place in that. I have my own story of sexual brokenness yeah. um, and um, that encompasses a, a lot of things, but is really what shifted my life off off of the path I was on career-wise and into the counseling field mm. uh, to begin with um, just because of some of the great guidance and counsel that I had mm. had in that specific area. That's huge. That's awesome. I don't, I don't think I knew that there had been a different trajectory for your life. So that's kind of cool. I did. That's a, a good thing to learn about you here. Yep. Um, so in, uh, in talking to people, uh, uh, I think we are both conversationally okay with stepping into all kinds of realms of sex. Um, I, uh, on the way here was having just a check-in conversation with my oldest son because I just, I know the world is big and I know sex is out there and I just want to keep the conversation open with him. And, uh, he said, it's always awkward to talk to you about it, but it's, you make it the least awkward that it can be. And I said, that's a win. <laughs> okay. And, uh, I won't force it to happen all the time, but, um, it is an uncomfortable topic. It, it's, it is, uh, despite how glorified it is in the culture, somehow we still also don't really know how to have conversations about it. So, um, maybe one thing I'm wondering is, uh, describe, uh, as a, as a person steps into counseling with you for the first time and, uh, they're, they, maybe they know why they're there. They're like, I'm dealing with some kind of, uh, sexual brokenness. Maybe they don't, maybe that's not on the surface, but if they do and they, they come in and they sit down and they start talking, um, how, how easily do they talk about that? And then kind of describe like an average progression of uh, how somebody kind of opens up, uh, mm -hmm. throughout that process. Sure. Yeah. First, I would say uh, addressing just the, you talking to your son, like yeah. that's huge. Mm -hmm. And I would say for the people listening, um, if if we could see, if we could say, raise your hand <laughs> um, without judgment, without blame, um, most of us didn't get those conversations. I did not. <laughs> and it's hard to say that sometimes because because in a lot of cases we had great parents or yeah. they they. Uh, they met our needs in many, many other ways, mm. but that was a conversation we did not have yeah. and that was not a subject that was not talked about at mm. all, regardless of how awkwardly. So we were forced to learn uh, at school, in the locker room, on the bus, you name it. Yeah. So great job there. Mm. I would just say continue to do that. That's cool. Um, when people come into my office, uh, this comes from a couple of different places. Okay. Either uh, something has gone really sideways uh, in a very dramatic way in their life, similarly to kind of what happened in my life as far as that got me into the counseling room, okay. where I had to uh, I had to come in and address it directly. Yeah, this is the issue. This is what's happened. Uh, my life has blown up. Gotcha. Um, and so, uh, in that case, it seems like because of the, the, some of the external pressures, people are more likely to have some conversations. Okay. I think even in that setting, it's hard to be fully honest mm. at times with, um, what exactly has happened. So yeah. you, you get a lot of euphemism talk, you get a lot of talk around the subject. And so, um, some, my way of diffusing that a lot of times is just to be very direct. Yeah. So are you saying that this happened? Yeah. Are you saying that you had an affair? Yeah. Are you saying that you, you, you currently struggle with same sex attraction Yeah. or that you were uh, molested? That's what I'm hearing. Yeah. I'm hearing, you know, so I will be as direct as I can yeah. to help people try to know that it's safe yeah. to have those conversations. Yeah, that's good. Um, or even just use the words that I know I can, I can just tell they're wanting to say. Yeah. It's empowering to like language is so powerful and it's empowering to give people the words, uh, to use to describe an experience because without the language, they are fumbling, uh, to find anything they can say or to use, uh, what has been appropriate in the past to describe it, um, or to veil what feels too painful to say outright. And so. Yeah. Even for you to say uh, on its face, this this thing, are you saying this? Um, I can I can imagine that is a uh, that's probably a light bulb moment often for people to go like, yeah, okay, <laughs> like mm -hmm. that you you yep, 
yep, I, I took 20 minutes to explain that. And you told me in a sentence or two and yeah, I've never said it that simply, but absolutely. Um, uh, is it, is it a light bulb moment for people? Yeah. So this is, if, if I've heard one phrase, um, and, and again, to people listening, like you probably would identify with either having said this potentially in a yeah. counseling office or to a trusted friend yeah. or for someone, but I, I've heard this phrase many, many times and I, and I hope I never get used to hearing it because I, I want to honor the weight of it, mm-hmm. but it's, um, I've never told anyone this. Yeah. Um, even if someone is coming to see me in a very broken situation, that is obvious. Yeah. Um, uh, and they're talking about it, what got them there or the thing underneath that is almost always, um, it starts with the sentence of I've never told anybody this. Mm. Yeah. And, um, and that usually opens up like, you know, wow, like what did that, what did that feel like to say that, you know, to say that either that's what you have done or did or what was done to you Mm. or said to you. Um, and that, that usually is a good opening up for that conversation. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. I, I, um, I'm thinking now that I I probably even could have opened this by just saying like, Hey, um, Friends, as you're listening, there's probably a good chance that uh, as we talk, you're going to think of the things in your life that uh, are yeah. in that shame place. You're going to think of yeah. that. And so just a almost a not a trigger warning, but just say like, hey, I care about you and we care about you and we want you to navigate this. So if at any point this gets like, oof, I feel overwhelmed, p- pause it, come back to it, um, listen to it with somebody you love and hold a hand if that helps you get through it. But um, it's... It, shame is powerful. Like shame, shame will perpetuate hiding. It's from the first story in the garden. It's they, they fall and they hide. And, um, um, there is something powerful about saying the thing you never thought you would say. Um, it was the, the experience I had through my inventory of writing literally every thing that came to mind, every little transgression, every little fantasy, just write it all out and then sit across from a trusted friend and say, I'm going to read this list to you. And it's, this feels wild to speak out loud. It felt wild to write it down and to finish the whole thing and to hear like, thanks for sharing. I appreciate that. You were, you are brave just now. It's a big deal. And, uh, God sees you and he loves you and, uh, you don't have to hide it behind any of those things anymore. That's the, like, that's the kind of gut wrenching soul changing moment. Um, it can really change the trajectory of a person's whole life. That's, it's, it's incredible. So, yeah. um, what do you think, uh, as you think about shame and how people work through shame, um, what are some of the, the common, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like the, the way the self-protective, uh, modes that people use or the, the, the skills or the, there's a word here I can't find in my head, but the things that people do to protect themselves, yeah. what are some of the common ones? And then, uh, how have you seen people kind of grow to gain new skills? Yeah. So, uh, Yes coping strategies or, um, you know, that, that's the kind of thing that you're talking about. Like what, what are the strategies people yeah. use to diffuse the shame? Maybe that's, that's the exact word. <laughs> Just was tip of the tongue, man. Okay. That's been going on. And so, um, and I, and I, and this, I may get this quote wrong, but it's the most accurate quote about shame that I've ever heard. And it says, shame is like a raincoat over the soul that repels the living water of God that would establish us as his sons and daughters. Hmm. Hmm. And so it's so powerful uh, in our lives. And, uh, and why is it that it is so often tied with sexuality or sexual, our sexualness hmm. or our sexual being? Well, because that's like the inmost of the inmost of kind of who we are. Yeah. And so, um, and so how that gets mishandled, with that comes a lot of shame. We have a lot of messages about that yeah. from our family of origin, from wherever. Most of us didn't get a very healthy message about sexuality, if at all. Yeah. And so what is there says, I have to hide. Yeah. Just like what you were saying about Adam and Eve. I have to hide or people can't know this about me. Yeah. Um, 
if if they knew this, then they would think or do, or I would never be able to or allowed to X, Y, Z. Yeah. And sometimes those, those phrases that people say, I would never, like, they maybe don't even have to make sense, but it's the, the fear of you, you start, you don't, if you start to populate that, you realize those don't make sense. I'm not going to like, that's not actually going to happen, but it's easy to, if you try to sh- shut that one down, then the, the other ones pop up around that are like, mm-hmm. well, I don't know about all, there's too many of them to answer all of them. I'm, I'm overwhelmed. There's a threat here. I can't do it. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And so, so then, uh, so then shame becomes a part of our, our of our life and, and we hide and we protect ourselves, and we find coping mechanisms to do that. And those, a lot of the, a lot of the times, the people that I talk with, or we start when we start digging, we find out that some of those coping mechanisms that they learn to deal with life are sexual in nature. Yeah, and that's kind of like I think what you were speaking to when you entered your step study, and you start realizing these things. And you know, if you've been to CR, you, you know, you do an inventory process, or you meet with a counselor, and you start to realize, like, oh, this is how. I am mishandling my pain. Mm. You know, I have found a successful strategy. It's successful in that it works until it doesn't. Yeah. Or until it affects our life in a really negative way. Yeah. Yeah, you get a dopamine dump from a porn binge or masturbation or something, and you're like, I'm I'm good to go. I don't have to be... I, I was stressed about work or stressed about this conflict, and now I'm not, and I can move away from it yep. for a few moments and... Uh, but it it doesn't uh, it doesn't last, and it doesn't actually remedy the situation that is painful, mm-hmm. and um, so it's a big deal. Um, well, then the cycle starts, right? Yeah. Because then after that, right? Then 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 we feel bad or worse, mm. and then we're back to the shame cycle again. Mm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so, but but you're right in that, especially when it comes to sexually acting out. Um, I, I think it's a, a big surprise for a, a lot of clients when I say, can you see how that worked for you? Yeah. Like, can we, in a weird way, can we honor for a second that, that that strategy, as messed up as it was or what it led to, it did serve a purpose in your life and it, and, and it did, um, like, let's look at what did happen from that. Yeah. A lot of chemicals went through your body. You didn't know another way to cope. Yeah. You had your anxiety was at eleven all the time. Yeah. Well, of of course, some kind of sexually acting out. Of course, yeah. that's going to lower that yeah. and make life more tolerable. Mm. But usually, what comes along with that is then another huge heap of shame. Mm. That's good. Yeah. yeah I mean, in, in a really uh, silly example, but I think it lays back over this is um, uh, I hear people like complain about procrastinating. They're like, ah, I procrastinated again, but you wouldn't procrastinate if it wasn't working. Like if, if it yes. truly hosed you time after time, you would stop procrastinating. But when you can put it off and put it off because you're stressed about it and then just nail something in the last minute and get it done and get it in and it, you don't reap any bad consequences. You're like, all right, that, that that's a strategy that works. It's yes. maybe not as good as being slow and thoughtful through the thing, but, uh, and, and I hear you explaining that in the same kind of bucket. Of 100%. So, um, and that's, that's, that is very I think it's very hard. It was very hard for me mm. when a counselor asked me, um, have you ever thought about how that, how your strategies and your coping mechanisms helped you when you were this young person who didn't have the capacity to deal with those things? Yeah. And I was like, no, because it's, it was bad and it was wrong. Yeah. And that's all I knew. Yeah. Bad, wrong, mm. shouldn't have done it, shouldn't have looked at that. X, Y, Z. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Hmm. There's, I, there's a thought kind of gurgling in sure. here, I guess, um, that, um, I almost, as you, as you talked about the number of people that sit down and either it's the first presenting thing or it is a complicating factor. Um, one of the things I'm, I'm saying this weekend, I, it might even be, st- I don't know where it, I picked it up, but I think I probably stole it from CR that we're all sexual strugglers. Is that a okay. CRism? Yeah. I mean, a very common that like we're all strugglers, right. Okay. And, yeah. and, and to some degree, and I would say that it, I'm sure there are stories out there of people in the recovery process that does not involve some form, but um, it's almost inevitably in there some way. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that it's um, 
yeah, I, I think the thing that I've been turning over, I'm, I, I'm, you're hearing this after I've preached, but I'm, I'm still in the process of working through it. So we're in this weird time jump thing here. But um, as I'm preparing for this sermon on the 26th, um, there is so much of what I'm turning over that is just like, um, I think people, because they are embodied uh, and because God from uh, as built into it, like every person is, is flesh and chemicals and organs and relationships. It is, it, it is like innate to what it means to be a human being. And the first thing that he says in the garden to in Genesis one twenty eight is be fruitful and multiply. So the first command out of the gate is a, is a sexual command, like go produce, ba- have a lot of sex, produce babies, fill the world with them. And they're going to continue that process. Um, so there is something we're not only supposed to be sexual, but there's something deeply innate about humanity that is this sexuality and, and this um, uh, what it means to be embodied, what it means to not just be spirit, but be flesh and spirit mingled. Um, and I, I don't really know what question I'm driving at here, what observation I'm trying to drive toward, but but um, I um, it, it, it is the kind of, maybe, I'm, maybe what I'm trying to say is like, uh, maybe it's picking the shame thread back up and it's saying like, shame tells us that we're utterly alone in this. And what I see in creation and what I see in what God has told us about ourselves and what I see in my own body and the bodies of everybody I look at is, uh, this is not supposed to be shameful and it's not supposed to be tam- taboo and it's not supposed to be in the dark, um, but uh, sin has pushed it there. And we have an ability in trust and in, in um, uh, it, it is a tender thing to, to go there in conversation, but we have an ability to draw from the darkness out into the light, this thing that was supposed to always be out in front because it's, it is something core to who we all are. And uh, the ability to talk about it in a way that is not destructive or not adding to shame or not um, heaping guilt on actually gives life to everybody that gets to be a part of that conversation. Um, and I'm get I'm, I'm maybe just like saying when I think about people doing this in counseling or through step studies, I'm guessing this is your experience as you're sitting across from people walking this same path over and again of being drawn out from the darkness and into the light and going this thing that seemed far too big and far too scary. I'm thinking about inside out Two now that mm-hmm. her big creepy monster thing that's hiding in the shadows. It's a giant hulking thing. And when the secret finally spills out of his mouth, it's I burned a hole in the rug. And it, so it's like when it's drawn to the light, it's not nearly as horrifying as you think yep. in deep in your soul all those times. Um, so, um, which, which let me just yeah, interject yeah. there, Jump which it. is one of the great parts. And, and I know we've referenced this, um, but but whether it's CR, whether it's AA, whether it's any type of recovery type program or a counselor's office, there is something that if you ask people who visit on Friday night, for example, I mean that's yeah. where I that's I, I'm using that as a continual reference because that's a ministry I'm involved in. Yeah. But one of the very first things, if you have someone come that's either checking it out or just visiting, they will inevitably say, "I can't believe that someone said that." Like yeah. did that guy just say like did he did that lady just say that she, like, she struggles with same-sex attraction, alcohol, and a pill addiction? Yeah. That's wild. Yeah, and she's on the stage, so she's elevated as a leader in this context. That that it, It's it's mind-breaking, for sure. And I'm glad to be here, or yeah. this is my forever, whatever the case is, but there is something in the fact that, man, once that's spoken out loud, I mean, it's like a weight I mean, I remember just coming for the first time and knowing what it was, but even and even had have having been in recovery groups before CR, just hearing other people talk about their stories is so freeing. Mm. So giving people the freedom to to uh, say these things, maybe it's in my office, right? But just giving them the freedom to say what it is to use the words that maybe uh, aren't appropriate or that they have always been told weren't appropriate, yeah. you know, or to acknowledge. I mean, for you to acknowledge uh, with your son or with our kids to acknowledge things like, I mean, I, the other day, I, my four-year-old said, she is really pretty. <laughs> and I was like, tell me about that, buddy. Yeah. Like, like there is something in him that he's like, oh, like that girl there is very pretty. Yeah. Uh, and so it's like, well, how do we speak into that when, when, when our kids are 
12, 13, 14, you know, 11 to going through puberty age. Yeah. And to, and to be able to, to give them the freedom to, to even uh, wrestle with these ideas. Yeah. Um, is it okay for me to think that girl's pretty or not? Or is yeah. that, am I already breaking some rules here? I don't know. And it sounds like you caught him in a really like tender place and we're curious. Or why do, why do I have the feelings that I have? Mm-hmm. Right? Like, why do I, I mean, I think that's a big thing we go back to. And I, I have a lot of conversations about of like, if I would have just been able to ask somebody mm-hmm. or tell somebody like, this is what I'm thinking. It would have been diffused. Mm-hmm. Meaning that somebody, a safe adult would have said, yeah, that's normal. Yeah. Like, this is normal. Mm. This is what happens in your body when this happens at, at this particular age. This is why you want to kiss that that girl, or or maybe this is why. Uh, for some people, though, they, there's a lot of shame wrapped up in some type of same sex attraction, yeah. and they're just like, "Well, something's desperate, deeply wrong and flawed with me." Yeah. And mm. if they would have had a safe adult that could speak life into them, and and also not afraid of this subject somebody probably could have normalized an an experience. Let's assume the experience was uh, what we call a normal child, developmentally appropriate childhood sexual experience there that does exist. Yeah. Um, And, but, but instead what happened for most of us is there was uh, sometimes there was a a situation that was inappropriate. We'll kind of table that for a minute, but for many of us, there was, what, what, what I would, what we would call in psychology or counseling appropriate, developmentally appropriate childhood sexual exploration. Yeah. But because we didn't have anybody telling us that's, that's appropriate, like that's not inappropriate or tell me about that. What happened or where, where were you? And, you know, because we didn't get that feedback yeah. about the situation, we then answered that question for ourselves as a very young person without the developmental ability to answer that question. Yeah. And usually it's wrong because we were told your privates are your private. Yeah. Nobody else. Yeah. And so it's like, well, then why did I, why did I touch that, that kid's private in at preschool or at yeah. kindergarten or whatever. And that is where that shame monster grows. As you spoke about, about the inside yeah. out monster, it just grows. Yeah. Hmm. That was good. Um, I'm thinking you, you kind of set to the side a particular category there in the middle of that. And I'm guessing that is the um, actually disorder, like um, actual offenses, like things that were yeah. wrong that were done to people that weren't supposed to be done. And I think we would maybe be remiss if we didn't step into that yeah. for a moment. Is sure. there anything you would want to kind of fill that that picture out for us? Well, yeah, I mean, I think for, and, and this is the thread I think that I hear a lot in people's stories, uh, example in testimony night, uh, even if someone is coming and they're talking about their chemical dependency and that's their main issue, uh, inevitably, a lot of times there will be some thread of some kind of childhood sexual abuse. Yeah. And so um, that is a situation where uh, anything from an adult to a child is sexual abuse, yeah. right? And then there's this this questioning about, well, was that, was this situation? And I would say, well, one of the filters to run that through is, was it unwanted? Yeah. Um, was this an older? Was this an older kid that um, that kind of perpetrated this? Yeah. Um, and so um, there's several other kind of filters to run that through when trying to discern was this a was this a kind of a normal childhood experience or was this actually somebody being predatory in nature? Yeah. And the reason I just said, hey, we're gonna kind of table that is because. That is a whole other thing. Yeah. And so if there's shame attached to what could be appropriate childhood sexual exploration, then you can multiply it by a thousand for something that we believe or that we know was absolutely inappropriate. Yeah. 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 And the, um, there's, there's a lot of power, even that I'm thinking about the CR inventory process. And one of the things there is the ability to write next to some item on your list I'm, I'm not responsible for this at all. And, and so the, the abuse stories are those that, that somebody offended against me. I didn't do anything to ask for that. I didn't want that. I've felt guilt and shame about it. I don't need to, like Mm -hmm. nobody is holding me responsible for that. Um, I know one of the muddling ones in there sometimes is, um, my body reacted. Does that mean I wanted it? Uh, And even being able to go, no, like, but body, it's it's one of the ways I diffuse sometimes with um, people who are like, 
I might be same sex attracted and I don't know. And if you, when I start asking if they're like, well, I, I saw some same sex porn and I was like kind of aroused by that and I didn't know what to do with it. I was like, well, it's kind of made for that purpose. So if you're aroused at a thing that's forcing everybody that watches it to be aroused, like I, I might slow you down to jump to the conclusion that that's something you struggle with. Obviously people do struggle with that, but you might not be in that category after all. So um, all of that just winding around um, into the same piece that like it is really hard to it's it's hard enough to navigate as it is yep you add in complications of people really doing it wrong and hurting other people for their own joy and their own gratification and that's just truly evil and wrong um um so i i think i want to kind of we're kind of wrapping up a conversation here and and landing um what if somebody's been listening somebody's been like they've just got a thing locked in their mind or several stories or their own. They're just like, I feel it already. I don't know what to do about it. Um, what are some helpful, um, next steps in, in, in stepping into dealing with this kind of puddle of shame that they're feeling or this, this, um, sexual story and kind of knowing what to do with it. Yep. Well, as you can see, I mean, where our story went, right. There could be some listeners like, how did they get there? Yeah. Well, to your, to your point earlier, like this is where, this is how hard it is and some of the reasons why it is so hard to even have conversations yeah. or even listen to a sermon topic yeah. a, a, about sexuality or sexual sin or anything because it's wrapped up in, we just went through several scenarios that it is possibly wrapped up in for many people. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. Um, I think one of the first things is um, if something resonated with you, either from the sermon, yeah. right, or from this discussion about like, yeah, I I just, I'm embarrassed as an adult to even have this conversation. Mm-hmm. I mean, there is, my wife and I have talked about this, so my 11-year-old son, uh, there even, as a therapist and having my own story, I am even reluctant at times to have conversations. Yeah. Now, some of that could be because it's bumping against my own story and some of my own things. Yeah. But it's also because I'm I'm in this place with you and with everybody else listening. Like this is not, it's not necessarily easy. Mm. Um, so one of the first things I would say is if something has, if this conversation brought up anything in you or the sermon brought up anything in you, um, and especially if it's brought up things that you don't, want to think about or yeah. you just were like oh yeah that i don't want to keep that hidden or in that category that. you've never yeah. said it to anybody that category yeah so one of the very great things to do is to find somebody a trusted person that you can talk to without yeah. judgment right yeah. and the church has plenty of resources for yeah. that whether it's so whether it's trusted people on staff to the counseling center to um you know if there's somebody safe in your own life to just yeah. to 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 get that out hmm. um, because usually these things that are kept in um, or stuffed down um, are actually coming out in other forms in our life. They're coming out sideways somewhere. Yeah. Well, no matter what it is we're trying to stuff. Yeah. If we're trying to stuff something, it's it's coming out sideways somewhere else, maybe yeah. in anger, maybe in some other uh, coping mechanism or uh, uh, addiction or something else. Yeah. So um, that would be one of the very first things I would do mm. is pinpoint like, okay, what was it? If you can, like, what was it that was even hard for me to hear mm. in the sermon or in this, in this uh, podcast? Yeah. Um, and then to reach out, um, reach out to a trusted person to say, Hey, like, I would like to talk more about that. Or I'd like to, I'd like to maybe have a session with somebody yeah. um, at the counseling center or, yeah. you know, about, about, this whole sermon series maybe, yeah. Yeah. or, you know, or, or you don't have to say anything, yeah. right? You don't have to give a reason, but that it's, it's worth, it's worth exploring in your life. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Um, uh, I think Michael will have ended the sermon, um, or the ended the, the whole service. He's, he's doing the closing benediction or he will have done t- t- talking in the weird time thing here, but he, he's doing the, the CR line of, um, the opposite of addiction is not whatever it is. It's, it's connection. Mm-hmm. And so we're, we're looking for connection. So yeah. uh, if you're hiding in shame, it's not serving you well at all. And it, it has served you because it's protected you and it's, it's been a coping mechanism, but we want to invite you out into the light, however you can find that. So, 
Um, we, uh, my email address, uh, M A N O E T Z E L at fellowship NWA.org. Um, I might not be the person to talk to, but I might be able to help you find somebody to talk to. Um, uh, again, the counseling center on, on the campus is here. There's a lot of other yeah. pastoral staff. If you got somebody, um, small group people, best friend, whatever it needs to be. Um, but, uh, uh, start, start pulling that thread of that sweater and let it see what unravels. Um, and, uh, Matt, I'm, I'm grateful, dude. This was yeah. fun. Yeah, and, yeah. I uh, hope it was helpful, and yeah. um, it was a great conversation. I'll just say uh, one thing that came to mind while you were talking is yeah. um, this is going to hit everybody differently. Yeah. But, man, uh, I want to say I have never in, in my life been a part of a church. I've been on even on staff in the past at, some, at, a, at a church but like uh, and involved in many ministries. And so – while this subject may even make some people uncomfortable, or I can't believe we said that, it is a gift to be a part of a church mm -hmm. that would even attempt to handle this in a right way. Yeah, it's a big deal, mm -hmm. and I and I just want to reiterate, like that's a, that's a gift to, to anyone who's listening, to the congregation, to myself, to be mm -hmm. a part of a church that 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 I know is rightly trying to handle not only the word, but these very hard life situations mm -hmm. and it's a safe place. Yeah. So thank you for even, uh, even asking me to be a part of the conversation. It's a big deal, dude. It's a big deal. The, um, the, the there's a, another quote, I, uh, you butchered one earlier. You thought you might, I, I'm going to butcher one to end here is, um, the, the place where we fear we might be the most alone is actually the place of our deepest, source of human connection, like mm -hmm. the, the ability to talk about the things that really do make me so uniquely Natsel and not like anybody else. When I talk about those things, when I drag them up, even if they're good, just healthy parts of me, when I share those out of a, a passion to be known and to know others, uh, those are the places where I find the most connection. And, um, so be bold, lean in, um, also just, I'm, I feel tender. I, I don't want to end with the hurrah, hurrah if you're yeah. beat up. And so, um, we're really for you, Mosaic, and uh, we love you a lot. And uh, we'll keep seeing you week after week. We'll see you this Saturday or last Saturday or next Saturday, whichever time we are here. Uh, we love you lots. See you.